Thank you all for being here today. I'm um, really excited to be here and talk a little about something else for a change. Um, for those who don't know me, I'll be one of the founders of Cherry. It's our fifth company as a founding team, all within a data space and different companies. Last one we sold to Oppenheimer, the investment bank, doing something very similar right now in the real estate space. So we take you a little bit further back, right? Let's go back to the 80s. Some of you were born in the 80s, myself included. Um, financial services looked very different back then, right? Um, a lot of siloed data, a lot of people heavy operations, people running around with tickets to close transactions. They thought they were making really good decisions, right? And they were for the time. Talking about really great investors, smart investors, dealing with a lot of data and a lot of really great decisions. Those traders from 1980s wouldn't even recognize the market that we're talking about today. Everything's changed. We're in a world where predominantly everything's electronic data. The data silos have, by and large, have been broken down. We have interoperability from almost every data system. We have huge, huge data markets today for everything that you can possibly imagine. Companies like Bloomberg and Aladdin, which most of our industry is built on, they won. They won pretty quickly, too. It wasn't much of a battle. Those who adopted technology early, those who broke down the data silos, started with collecting data, moved into workflow automation, eventually went into advanced analytics, and finally, autonomous decision making, which is today what we would call typically high frequency trading, things of that nature. It didn't happen overnight. So to those traders back in the 80s looking at that market, there wasn't a moment that just everything changed. But looking back 20, 30 years later, nothing looks the same. This happened in other industries, right? I mean, think about warehousing. Think about um, advanced manufacturing. That world is very different today. We can't even think or fathom the idea of a human being involved in part of that process. It's happening as we speak in other industries like healthcare and insurance. Once the data silos break down, we see automation. When we see automation, we see automated automation, right? Which is what we would call typically machine learning. And eventually you see autonomous decision, right? Think of Kiva robots running around um, in Amazon boxes. Think about, think about um, autonomous cranes designing buildings, things of that nature. It happens really, really fast. The real estate industry is not going to be very different. Um, it's the largest asset class by far in the world. It's orders of magnitude larger than any other asset class. So the incentive to get this right is really, really big. It's not going to happen overnight as well, right? To those investors in the room, whether you're in debt, risk, um, equity, whatever it is that you're looking at right now, that world will change. It's not going to happen overnight again. It will start with CMBS, RMBS, CLOs, things that trade automatically. It will continue into people modeling different types of consumer plays. How many people visited this Apple store? How is that similar to the Apple store next door? It will trickle down really quickly to the rest of the market until at some point you'll wake up 20 years from now and say, this doesn't look like anything that I know. It's not like what I've been investing for years. Nothing's going to happen overnight, but it's going to be very profound. And there are winners already. So if you went now and looked at some of those hedge funds, biggest hedge funds in the world, the one that made these same changes back in, from manual trading to electronic trading, these are the first movers right now. The insurance companies and banks are building massive data silos as we speak. So these are warehouses that collect every single piece of data they can get their hands on. They start by putting the data into a single store and answer is really simple things like, some reporting, doesn't sound very sexy, reporting, benchmarking, but that's the first step. First, let's get a sense of what we have. Then let's start putting that data into workflow automations. Can we get some things that we've been doing so far very manually and start learning about those processes very quickly? And after I've learned about those processes, insight will start to come pretty quickly. Why do we do certain things? How do we do certain things? And at one point, you'll wake up and again, decisions will start becoming autonomous without you even noticing. The window to make changes is very small, unfortunately. We're not talking about a window that's really, really wide. It's not a 15, 20 year span. Those who adopted technology last time around in the early stages won. Those who didn't lost. There's a very specific reason. There's a first mover advantage when it comes to data. The longer time you have spending on processing data, cleaning data, collecting data, the smarter you are and be able to make decisions on that data. The faster you're running machine learning models that have inferences. The more time and more data that runs through those models, the better they get. The more it's being tagged, the more it's being reaffirmed. Until at some point you're able to make autonomous decisions or at least decision support systems much faster than your peers. And that's going to be an advantage. Whatever advantage you have today, and we'll talk about that in a second, those advantages are not going to be the same advantages that you have five, ten years down the road. Having cheap cost of capital is not an advantage. I know a lot of people think, I have cost of capital really low, I'm going to win, I have more money. That's not a sustainable advantage. The cost of capital is coming down for everyone or it's going up for everyone. Your ability to have information that you're safeguarding that nobody else has is no longer the advantage that you thought it had, that you had. That world is changing and the first movers win. This isn't as scary as it sounds. Um, Clowns are scary, I admit. But the vast majority of you in the room are sitting here going, you know, 
should I be terrified from this new world? The answer is, of course, you should be terrified. Things are changing. Your jobs are changing. The data you care about today is not the same data you care about tomorrow. The business functions that you care about today are not the same business functions tomorrow. So in that sense, it's scary. All change is scary, right? But it really shouldn't be scary. But this should be a moment of reflection of saying, OK, given that that's where we're going, given that we're in this new world that's going to change, where should I be going as an organization? And it requires the first question, which is a really honest and terrifying question. What are we good at as an organization? What is it that we do well that allows us to win deals over our competitors? Why do we underwrite risk at a lower number, right? Why do we outperform ROI, NOI, churn? Why do we do things better than our competitors? And if you can't answer that question, that should terrify you. But if you can answer that question, you should be really excited because this is an opportunity to take that advantage and pull that into five, 10 years down the road. So this is a moment of reflection. Do I know what we do well? And as I mentioned, the cost of capital being lower is not what you do well. It's what you do with a lower cost of capital. What are you able to do that your peers are not able to do? And how do you take that, that long-term moat that you've created up until now and make that moat relevant five, 10 years down the road? It requires putting a plan in place and identifying what is that vision I'm trying to go towards. What do I want to achieve? What does my world look like five, 10 years from now? Are my automating ROI adjustments? Are my automating NOI adjustments? Am I trying to optimize for lower churn in commercial residential buildings? Am I trying to improve, improve my tenant experience? What is it do I want to achieve, right? What does my underwriting process look like five years down the road? Am I going to have an analyst go and put an Excel spreadsheet and getting 200 different deals from a te you know, teasers from brokers? Am I going to have a QA team behind the scenes checking this information, 15 different you know, systems? Am I going to have inspections, people going to the house and looking at properties the way they used to? If you think that world's existing, you're the stockbroker of the 80s, right? If you think you're going to be changing these processes, now it's exciting, right? How do we do all automated, values around, automated models around valuation? How do we automate the underwriting process, the risk assessment process? How do I have benchmarking across the board? Don't have to answer this, but try and think about how many of you know exactly how many properties you own. Seems like a simple question, right? But for the vast majority of REITs and private equity firms, that in itself is a tough question. If you ask the question, if LIBOR goes up by a percent, how does that affect my entire portfolio? You probably have no clue how to answer that. If I ask what happens if you have a flood in Manhattan, down, how does this affect your entire stack? You have no way of answering these questions. Not because you're not trying, because again, we're talking about data silos that have never been connected, never been designed to connect. So that stage one is figuring out where we're going. We want to have automated ROI detection. We want to have automated underwriting. We want to have better risk analysis. We want to make sure that we make better decisions for our firms and make sure that we take that advantage that we've had and take into the future. Now we have to figure out how we do that, right? It sounds like a really easy thing. Oh, I know where I'm going. How do we get there? And it starts with data, like everything else. And you have to figure out where your data is coming from right now. You have a lot of data in your organization. You're buying a lot of data. You're buying from TREP and RCA and Comstack and CoStar and 50 different vendors who all have very unique data sets that are very valuable, right? The reason you're buying it is not because they're terrible vendors. You're buying it because that data is really valuable to your organization. It'd be a lot more valuable if it was connected, right? There's a lot of public data out there, things talking about deeds and mortgages and zoning and permits and violations and transportation and you name it, there's a data set out there. There's 300 and something thousand just in the public data domain. That's all data that could be very valuable to your organization. And finally, your internal data. This is the worst part, right? You're sitting on wealths of information within your organization and none of it's connected to each other. Your leasing department has perfect data about the buildings they're in, but your underwriting department has no clue what your leasing data looks like, right? How do you connect those Yardi and MRI and Argus and all those 15,000 other data systems that you have internally? How do you take all those Excels that are in unstructured systems right now and put them into some kind of automated process? This is the world you have to start figuring out. Where does my data come from? Where does it go to? Who's allowed to use it in different ways? What is the data governance around those pieces? How do I deal with PII, right? We have these new California protection. We have GDPR. How do we store data that we've been storing for years in our systems without really thinking about what happens to it? How do I pull this into the same place? Then we have a fairly easy stage. It sounds really complicated, but this is actually the easiest stage out there. I know where I'm going. I have a really clear vision of what that product looks like or what that product could look like. I have a really good sense of the data needs to go in there to make that happen. I'm trying to build an AVM, so I need multifamily for, let's say, multifamily. So I need the lease data, I need the OPEX data, I need the Argus models. I know what the models that are going into this. Now it's just a matter of putting it to work, right? Once you've identified the use case and you identified how to get there, it just becomes a build versus buy decision. And these decisions should be really easy. Back to the question, what do you do well as an organization? If you are a technology firm and your expertise is connecting data, pulling data, and putting that into a single model, that's what you should be doing, because that's what you do best. But if your expertise is investing in properties and identifying uh, the best place to put uh, risk, identifying long-term trends in markets, understanding what's hot, what's not hot, understanding how consumer trends are going to change over the years, 
this is probably not what you do best and you should find someone who does that best. You're not building a new Excel tool, some are. You're not building a new PowerPoint tool. You're not gonna build new Amazon Cloud or Google Cloud. Those are things you don't do well. Those are things you buy. Ask yourself, do you do data pipes really well? Do you build data lakes really well? If the answer is yes, you should definitely do that. If not, you should find someone who does that better and pay them. It will definitely be cheaper, faster, and better. Now that you've connected all your data, whether you've built it in-house or you've bought some kind of solution to do so, now the question is what do I do with all this data here? I know my long-term goal, automated ROI or automated underwriting, that's great. That's a great long-term goal to move forward to. But what do I do today? What do I look at, right? I open up my computer in the morning, I'm an investment manager, what do I see? What is that visual that I'm looking at every day which tells me, okay, what happened? Did prices go up, did prices go down? That little world of what happened, that declarative analytics, moving into descriptive analytics is what we would often call BI. It looks like Tableau, it looks like charts, it might be a custom application giving you a little data on you know, demographics or something like that. That world is really broad. Find whatever tool it is that makes your life easy. This is where a lot of application layers that some of the folks that are already out there understand, right? Whether it's an MRI or Yardi or Argus, instead of just having data in that little silo, you want data coming out to that and connecting to all your other data sets, right? This is where you start seeing all these applications on top of it. And very quickly, after you've done that, after you're able to answer what happened, you'll very quickly want to move into why things happened. And it's not trivial. To be able to answer what happened is fairly easy. You put dots on a chart, things went up, things went down. Being able to answer why things happened is actually a very complicated thing. That's when your data science team start coming on board. That's when you start building these little Machine learning groups are trying to figure out how do I run node to vec models on a graph which say, oh, these two things look very much the same. This is where all the really exciting stuff happens because if you can answer why things happen, I can also maybe answer why things will happen in the future. But if I can't answer why things happen, I definitely can't answer why things will happen in the future. So this is the really, really exciting part where we start understanding inferences. And eventually, these inferences get really, really good. What's a good example? Let's think about high frequency trading. It used to be a model, it used to just tell us, well, if you make an investment in Apple stock, there's a 60-something percent chance you're going to be profitable if you hold it for 30 days. There was a recommendation engine for a really long time with the big hedge funds. Until some point, that kept going up, 60, 70, 80, 90, until some point where we're saying we have a statistically significant understanding of where things are going, that we're willing to put investment models behind it. That's when things get really cool and automated. Now, this isn't going to happen in our industry anytime soon. It will happen at the low end. It will happen on things like CMBS, RMBS, um, CLO trading. It will happen in underwriting of risk and loans. It won't happen in equity investing quite off the bat. And the reason is a lot of you have really great ideas in your head that have never been codified in any way. That's good information. It's going to take many years for that information to be pulled out of your heads and into investment models in a way that's actually conformed across the market. But it will happen faster than you think. And if you think that advantage in your head is going to last, it won't. You should be thinking about how do I take the advantage in your head and multiplying that by everyone else. What you really want to be able to answer is, based on all the information in the world that I have access to, whether I bought it, whether it's internal, whether, I pay, you know, whether it came for free from some other source, based on all of my past decisions as an investor or underwriter or whatever that is, what is the likelihood of this event happening? And the more I can answer that in a more um, succinct and, and reliable manner, the more that process gets automated until you feel really, really confident decisions happening on their own. It will eventually make it to equity as well. That's our mission at Cherry. Um, our past company, as I mentioned, we sold to Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is a big investment manager in the equity space. The reason we did that last company is we looked for the last bastion within the equities world that hadn't been automated by this beautiful world that I just described. And that was a late stage private equity. And we did that company for a few years, sold to Oppenheimer, and I ran private equity there. In real estate, we're still in stock market of the 80s. Data is siloed, it's not connected. It's being used as a weapon by people every single day. It's not really high quality data. We don't even know how to measure the quality of that data. Our systems are completely silent and don't talk to each other. And that's what we're trying to solve. So our platform allows you to take all of your data from any source, public, private, internal, external, paid, free, whatever that is, starting from that raw, unstructured, I have no idea where that data is coming from, until actionable insight where you can actually build models on top of it and improve your processes. That's all we do at Cherry. We have a saying here. On the top of the mountain, we're all snow leopards. It's a Hunter Thompson quote. The continuation of that quote is, if you can do one thing in this world better than anyone else, you're a natural friend of mine. We only do one thing in the world, and that's real estate data, but we do it better than anyone else. Thank you very much.